Good evening, Sweetwater County School District number one. I'm Kelly McGovern. I'm the superintendent of our district, and we would like to welcome you to our last online forum that we're holding this evening. Um, thank you for joining us, or if you've had a chance to um, watch and participate in one that we had during lunch or earlier this morning. Um, thank you for those that have been involved with that. We hope this is a, a great use of your time to gather some information and also for us to get an opportunity to hear from you um, questions that you might have and ideas as we work together with your school district. Um, a couple of things before we get started. Um, I just want to introduce to you who we have here in the room. We're at the Central Administration Building. We're in the boardroom, um, as you may know. And so with that, I, I just want to let you know who's going to be um, helping us out and answer some questions as we get going. And uh, before I let those people introduce, I, I just want to say a big thank you to Zach uh, Gunyan. He's been helping us out so many times uh, with getting these broadcast to everybody and um, really making these things work. And um, so thank you, Zach, for all the work that you're doing for all of those. So with that, we'll let everybody introduce, and then we'll go ahead and we'll get um, this forum going. Good evening, everyone. I'm Casey Arnoldi. I'm the Special Services Director for Sweetwater One. Hello, I am Stephanie Tolman, and I am the Chief Information Officer for Sweetwater One. I also want to say a special thanks to Zach, because he puts up with a lot from all of us. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Nicole Bolton and I am the Human Resource Director for Sweetwater School District Number One. Good evening, I'm Scott Duncan, the CFO of the district. Hello, I'm Jody Garner, the Chief Academic Officer for the district. Dan Solaroli, Director of Facilities for the district. And before we start, can I just make the announcement before the comments start flying? I promise we are following the health orders and the guidelines. Um, we always wear our masks unless we are um, six feet apart, and then some choose to still wear their masks, but I promise you there is enough distance. So I promise we are following the orders. Yes. Stay away from me, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And again, welcome to everybody. Um, if I could, I'd like to frame, you know, why are we here? Why are we holding this online forum in, in such a different type of time that we've got? And um, Zach, if we could, could you go to our district website, actually first, our homepage? And um, I want to show you just real quickly where access to all these documents, we're not going to go through um, of all of the documents, but we want to let the audience know where those can be found. Um, and they're open for anybody to take a look at, at those. Um, when you start on there, um, at the top in that red, there's a link for the Cost Savings Task Force 2021. If you click on that, and then you go ahead and you scroll down, um, it's got photos of the task force. It's got the meeting dates. Um, it's got all of the recordings that we've tried to do. We've been using um, our swivel cameras. We think it's important. Don't ask anybody to do anything that you would not be willing to do yourself. Um, and then um, if you scroll on down, it's got lots of links for different documents that we've been using on there. And Zach, if we could, could you go to one that talks about the cost savings task force, the purpose and the process for that? Thank you. And Steph, I'll, I'll get us rolling on that one. And then if you want, you can talk about some of the technology sure. stuff for that. Absolutely. Um, like I had mentioned, um, the district, we assembled a cost savings task force for this year. For some of you, you may remember um, a similar process that the district used back in 2016, 2017. 
And in that school year, the district, um, again, was facing some really difficult financial situations. And so um, it was a great process to engage our community in, see what they thought. And so what we wanted to do this time was expand on those things that really went well for us in that time in the hopes that this could be another vehicle for um, bringing that input forward as we embrace um, a lot of potential change. This document here talks about what the task force is really all about, why was it assembled, and just real quickly, I think it's important for people to know, and, and I'm sure most of you are aware, um, because it's really been out there a lot with um, publicity and, and those kind of things, but um, at the end of August, Governor Gordon, or Gordon came out and asked um, districts on ways that they could handle a 10% or higher budget cut. And that was in um, a reaction to approximately a $500 million shortfall in K through 12 public education. And what followed after there was a letter that came forward to school boards and chairmen that also um, asked for what would those effects look like if you had a 10% cut on the daily operations within the school district? And also for feedback to the Select Committee on School Finance Recalibration, which is a legislative committee that is really taking a look at um, how the block grant for school funding comes in and are there efficiencies and things that districts across the state of Wyoming could be doing. And so really what we um, are interested in is one, if there's questions that any of you might have. And also we'd like to hear from you on um, what do you value in education? So what is it that is very important to you that you would like to see in your school district? Because what that does is it determines what those important priorities are for our families, whether you're a parent, you're a grandparent. Um, K through 12 education really affects all of us, not only now, but in, in the future of our state and the workforce that we have. So one, what do you value in education? And then also the second part is what cost savings ideas can you share with us? And so we're gonna go over um, a little bit about budget projections, things like that. Um, we've had a lot of great um, questions come our way uh, through this morning and then at lunch today. And so any idea is a great idea. The cost savings task force um, is not a decision making group. I think that's really important to say. Um, and neither are the ideas or the questions that we have over in the chat. It's really a way to open up communication and have that two-way conversation um, to help people gain an understanding of what the district is up against um, during this time. We know we've got a lot of things going on um, in the district, in the community, and in our nation. Um, and unfortunately, this is one of those that on a local level is very near and dear to many of our hearts. Uh, so the cost savings task force, if we kind of scroll down here, and I'm just going to hit the highlights very quickly, but we assembled a group and there's about 42 of us and they represent lots of different areas. We have um, teachers from that teach uh, various levels, different content areas. We have um, business members on there, members of the chamber, legislators, parents, um, we have a student on there, which is very important. So we really tried to get that array from K through 12, but also keeping in mind that we have early childhood uh, representation on there. And then what happens when kids leave um, Sweetwater One? And we want them to be successful and have those choices available to them, whether they are college, career, workforce, or military uh, ready, whatever they choose to do when they leave. 
So we have a group. There's about 42 of us, like I said. And uh, we've met two times. And we have two more meetings that are scheduled, one of them for this coming Thursday evening. And the idea for this Thursday is uh, we've got a communications email that Stephanie and the IT department has opened up. So some people, they are fine to engage in a chat on the YouTube. Others, they would just rather send in an email and share their input, and that is great. Uh, we welcome that very much. Um, and so the idea for Thursday is we have um, some ideas from the task force. We have ideas from the communications email. And then we also have um, ideas coming from this evening. So hopefully those are are good choices that people um, can decide what works best for them and then engage in that process. That's kind of a, a big picture of why are we here? How did we get here uh, for that? So we're really interested in, maybe you've got a question for one of us. We've tried to have good representation so we can get your questions answered. But the other is, what do you value in education? And then what cost savings ideas can you share with us um, that maybe it'll spark another idea or a conversation, uh, that kind of thing. Um, before we go to that, Stephanie, it looked like you were going to mention something about technology. And I what actually just wanted to speak to the videos that we are using, um, the swivel robots that we're using to record our cost savings task force. We wanted to take the opportunity. We've, we've given a few different methods for using the robots in the classroom, using Google Meets or um, there's the swivel teams app. So I just wanted to let everybody know that we're using each one of those methods for the first meeting. We weren't, I forgot or wasn't aware that we were going to record it. So we started a little bit late. And I know I've told teachers, you, you go back and you look at your recordings and you see it's just looking at the wall. So you will notice that for the majority of that first meeting, you can hear everything, but it's looking at the wall. We forgot to present the screen um, when we started the recording. The second recording, we used Google to present the screen and pin the iPad. So that's kind of how that looks. And this is the next meeting, we'll use the Swivel Teams uh, screen capture to do that meeting. So this just kind of gives our staff an example of how that looks in the classroom and what that can be like for students at home. So we're living it with everybody else. That's okay. We're learning together. Um, with that, there's a couple of documents that we shared um, in the task force, but I think it's good information that it lays that foundation, that groundwork on there for our discussion this evening. And so, um, Nicole, I'm going to turn that over to you. I don't know. Let Zach know which, I'm not sure which of the two you want to start with, but we'll take it from there. Um, <clears throat> and I've seen some questions already starting in the chat, and we'll address those after we go through some of the information and that we're trying to front load to hopefully answer some questions and show you guys where they're at. However, um, an honest mom with loving miracles, I believe the information I'm about to go over will um, answer a few of the things that you've put in the chat so far. So, Is that the ones regarding class size, yep. those types of things? Yep. Okay. Um, well, and I'll talk about the four-day week either now or a little bit later. But we have a cost savings task force talking points document that is on the web page. And... <clears throat> I know I don't know if they're named the same thing. Thank you, Zach. Um, basically, what this document does is it gives you an overview of the things that the district has already done over the past um, six years. And it started all the way back in 2015, 2016, when we had a budget shortfall. And there had to be a reduction in force. You'll hear me reference RIF but it's a reduction in force for 75 paraprofessional positions in the district. The next year was when we had to cut millions out of the budget due to cuts at the state level. That was the first year we froze salaries. We froze salaries the next three years. As you go through this document, you'll see the administrative positions, the certified positions, um, 
and the various classified positions and the different um, things that we did to cut cost. We ended up closing Lincoln Elementary. Um, it seemed like we were going to get a reprieve in 2019-2020. Boy, did we would have known what was coming. Mm -hmm. um, but that year, we were able to adopt a social studies curriculum. With these cuts and not being able to hire so soon, it has caused issues with um, being able to fill positions within the district. Um, the later that we are, that we have to open positions and the later that the applicant pools come in, the harder it is to fill those positions. But we're also in Southwest Wyoming competing against places such as Salt Lake City who a bunch of their districts ended up matching our beginning salaries, which is fine and dandy, but Wyoming is unique to the interests of many, and it is beautiful, but we don't have the target, and we don't have the entertainment. We don't have the pro sports that a lot of um, the younger generation has at their fingertips down there, so there's some things that we're looking at competing with that we just can't, and so that document will go over all of the things that we have done up until this point um, to start cutting the budget. As positions, we have had a higher freeze unless it's an absolute necessary position to fill. Um, we are not filling those positions at this time and every single position that has come open is being scrutinized um, to see if we can actually absorb that position. The um, next document starts to show our current um, capacity within our buildings. And so on this document, as you go through, you'll see that sections is identified and a section is a classroom, essentially. So if I have three kindergarten classrooms in the school, I have three sections. So you'll see that for instance, Walnut. Walnut has the capacity to have 15 classroom sections, K-4. And right now they do have 15. But if you go over a little bit and look at Desert View, for instance, K-4, they have the capacity um, to hold 20 sections. And right now they only have 15. Now I wanna preface that this year has been tough because we don't know if our drop in enrollment is exclusively to COVID. We know that we've had students that have dropped to go to K-8 or some other online institutions, but we also know that with the economy, economy being hit as it has been, that we've had families move out of town, and it's really hard to get a measure of which is which. And so our enrollment is down, which makes this um, look even more open, I guess. So if you go down, Zach, to the purple, you guys will see that if we just went off of our projected enrollment right now going into next year, with the current enrollment, we would actually be able to absorb four classrooms. Um, the legislature has been throwing out a lot of different ideas to help cut funding. They are recalibrating right now our, um, I'm gonna go blank, they are in the process of recalibrating our fiscal budget um, for the state. And so with that, they have tossed out the idea of increasing class size. Now, right now, these are all things just being said. There's no decisions being made. But with them saying that, we have looked at what that would do to um, reducing sections. So in the blue, if they moved our K-3 class size and we had 25 students in a class and then 412 had 30 students in a class, you would see that by moving students around, we would um, reduce sections by 10. Um, and then the last one, see, it's not, by the way, I just want to preface, we are not advocating for any of this. It makes me sick to even say this out loud. There's nothing that feels good about even talking about this. But on the last one, if K-3 class size went to 30 students per class, and 412 went to 35 students per class, you could see that we would reduce sections by 29. So that's another document that you can reference. The last document that I'm going to bring up just to point out is a substitute um, cost for our teachers and leave. 
And so on this document, you will see vertically the days of the week and approximately um, over the course of the year, how much sub costs were on those days as a um, total. And then horizontally, you will see the cost um, associated with the leave. So what sick leave cost us in substitutes, what personal leave and what professional development, the top ones activity and district, which is our um, district coaches and activity sponsors. You'll see that by when the alternative calendar task force met last year, it was not for cost saving measures. It was honestly to look at how we could restructure instructional time to keep teachers in the classroom more, but give them more uninterrupted time for PLC and start providing professional development outside the classroom as much as possible and keeping the teachers in the classroom because we know that when we have a highly qualified teacher in front of the students, that is going to make the largest difference. So, so a little feedback I got today for our acronyms. What's PLC, Nicole? Oh, sorry, Professional Learning Community. So it's where our teachers get together and collaborate and go over data and plan. Um, and so with that, now, of course, with the impeding budget, potential budget cuts, we are going to have to look at how the four-day week can save us money. One way with sub, sub costs is that is not hurting our staff. And so in looking at between professional development and one day, we're estimating about a half a million dollars in savings. Um, before we go on, just to preface again, our number one goal is to do what's best for students and keep these cuts as far away from them as we can. And we do not wanna hurt our staff. The last time that we had to do um, budget reductions, we, were, we didn't have to do a reduction in force with our certified staff. We were able to absorb positions through attrition, and that is what you want to do so that you're not hurting people. Um, we don't know how bad this is going to be, but the whole point to this cost savings task force is to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And when I say that the budget cuts are so exponentially high, I'm talking it could be anywhere from 18 to $16 million dollars. And that is not little cuts that come to meet those kind of um, demands. And so that is why we are looking at all of this. Do we want to increase class size? No. Do we want to cut any staff? No. Do we want to hurt any of our activities or anything like that? No. But if this is what comes down from the state, we don't have a choice but to look at this. And this is uncomfortable and something we don't want to do, but this is the reality of it. We're hoping that we can say we don't have to do any of it when the ultimate decision rolls down. And trust me, Superintendent McGovern, um, Scott Duncan, and Chair Jellicoe have been testifying and fighting for this district and showing what the devastating effects will be if this happens just to our district. Despite popular belief or opinions, this district does run very thin compared to... Um, a lot of other places. We run at the bare minimum with our admin, bare minimum with our teachers. We do not have a lot of paraprofessionals. We run very lean. And so the problem is, is when more budget cuts come, that's when we start affecting staff and students. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So I just want to preface that as we get into the rest of this. Thanks, Nicole. I appreciate you going over. Um some of that background information for us. Um, you know, I got to say in the task force meeting, we were going over some of that class size information and um, you could see the, the look on, we have several teachers in there and um, you know, that is increasing class sizes is not a good thing for kids. It's not good for our staff, um, but it was important to get that information about you know, what that could look like. And so I know one of the questions, um, you know, why would we entertain that, that thought? Please, please know we do not want to go there. We're not advocating for any such thing. Um, we know that uh, there was talk about, you know, what does that look like? And that's what we were trying to do was provide that information so that people would have factual info to go off of instead of, um, 
you know, what, what the rumor mill could be and those kind of things. That's not good for people. You know, good news or bad news, it's just important that we get um, facts out there for people to know uh, what that might look like. Um, Scott, could you go over um, just a couple of things as far as budget? Uh, what are we looking at maybe in some of those projections? You know, what, what could be the worst for that? What could be, you know, just kind of frame that in a, a little bit about what that fiscal outlook is. Sure. In terms of dollars, a 10% reduction to the block grant is about $8.14 million. A 20% reduction is $16.28 million. And a 30% reduction would be a $24.2 million. For certified positions, this would result in a reduction in force with newer staff vacating the job and possibly leaving the state. This would present a future recruiting problem for teacher shortage, including certification concerns. Um, Sweetwater One currently experiences difficulty in recruiting all certified positions, including special education um, certified staff and has so for many years. We know coming up, in these next three years budget-wise that next year's projected deficit is a little over three million. Um, the projected deficit in FY23, so that's two years out, is 7.8 million. And in FY24 is 12.84 million. Um, this reduction in foundation funding is largely due to the decrease in ADMs. And ADMs are average daily membership the legislative model automatically adjusts for those fluctuations through the block grant and the major maintenance funding formula. In other words, fewer ADMs reduces the allotted funding provided from the state level for building maintenance. The block grant is lowered automatically with decreased enrollment and allows for a three-year rolling average, which allows districts time to adjust. So those are some of the dollars that we're, that we're talking about in terms of reductions. Thanks, Scott. Not a, not a good thing, but I appreciate you putting those facts out there for us as we, as we get going. Um, I'm going to start off real, real quick. Um, Carla had a question in the chat, and then, um, and then perhaps, uh, Casey, we could talk about some special education, and I think that might address some of the other questions maybe that we've got in there. We want to make sure that we take some time and, and get those answered for everybody, but um, in the earlier meetings, um, there were really a lot of questions about, you know, what would happen, what is the district reduction in force policy that came up earlier, Carla. Um, questions about, you know, where do they find that information? How does that work? Um, I know Nicole talked a little bit about positions, but um, earlier today, there were questions about what's the timeline, you know, of notifying people, notifying our community of just keeping people informed of what is that process looking like. Um, those were some of the questions that came forward. Um, and let me make sure I answer those. So that timeline we believe in and giving people the information as soon as we have that, we don't want to you know, put things out there that aren't good for people or want to put them on edge. We just want to be able to say, you know, this is what we're up against. But we do believe in letting our staff know as soon as, as we can um, on those things and that we don't want to lose any, any staff and we want to do what's right for our kids. As far as the ideas for um, the cost savings, I think, you know, I... I don't remember a, a whole lot. There were really a lot of questions about how does facilities work? Are there things that we can do? You know, why can you purchase this way and not the other way? So um, some of the ideas on there today, I think the majority were asking, you know, clarifying questions about, you know, um, just getting those facts for it. Um, I don't remember, guys, I'll open that up for you. I don't remember a whole lot of ideas for cost savings coming in earlier. We today. had a lot Do of you? questions um, on activities and athletics. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was the big one that came up. They wanted to see those numbers. I know the cost savings task force had asked about that, also wanting to see the numbers of the budget for activities and athletics. And I think Scott has those numbers handy. 
Yes, I, I do. Thank I, you. You know, and that could be, Scott, if you want to take that real quick, I think that would be good to go along with what um, Carla's mentioning. So along those, I, I think they were gathering the information about pay to play um, and just asking and inquiring about that. So Scott, if you want to go with that. Yep. So the question that came forward was how much does a district spend in total for athletic activities, budgets, and what's the breakdown by school? So for Black Butte High School, it's a thousand. Um, Farson is a little over two hundred and fifty thousand. Rock Springs Junior High is a little over two hundred and sixty-nine thousand. Rock Springs High School is a million and eighty thousand. Wam Sutter about twenty-three hundred for a district total of about one point six million. Thank you. So. Casey, how about if we turn some things on special services over to you, a little background on that, and then maybe answer some of the um, questions that we've got that pertain to that area? Sure. Um, I think one of the big things that we hear about is, you know, the special education and the services because we have an influx, an increase within our district. So one of the questions is, is, you know, um, the funding because in... 2018-19, we got um, capped at 13,000 million because, the, or 13 million, jeez, <laughs> long day. Um, but we got capped at 13 million and we were capped because what they did is they went off the year prior to, which is that 17-18 school year. During that year, we had some retirements. We couldn't fill positions. Um, we had some open pair positions, my tenant staff, things like that. And so without filling those, that really put a kink into our money that we spent. So we did not get reimbursed for those positions that were not filled. So it ended up being $13 million, um, because those positions weren't filled. We didn't pay that salary, the benefits, those things. So we got capped on a lower amount than what we previously had. So that really hurt us because then we, when we went into that, we ended up having to take funding out of the general fund to pay for some of those services that we had previously in the years before that we were unable to fill. So it really put us down a million or a million or so, almost a million, 700 or some thousand. And so that put us kind of in the hole. So um, in special education, we still have to meet maintenance of effort. So regardless of that 13 million, we still had to hit that target of that 14, almost 14 million because of that maintenance of effort. So if you don't meet that, um, it could really ruin the amount of money you get in those federal funds. So you really have to make sure that you hit those local funds first and, um, and the state funds before we can hit those federal funds. Casey, can um, you explain just a little bit maintenance of effort? Yep. Like what? Yep. So maintenance of effort means that for special education, we still have to maintain our services based off the need of the student. So we still have to provide those services regardless of the cost. And so regardless of that cost, even if it's 13 million, we still have to pay that because that was the funding from the state. So we still have to meet that or match that year before for whatever it was. The thing with special education is um, regardless of services, we still have to we still have to provide those. You know, you may have some kids that have our tick, which is minimal services, but then we have those kids that um, are more severe, have more higher needs, that may need uh, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, adaptive PE. Um, speech and all the active, uh, academic pieces, you know, maybe functional behavioral, social, emotional, um, reading, writing, things like that. So we still have to provide those services. Um, with our community, we're seeing an influx. So we're increasing. We're not decreasing in enrollment for SPED and identification. So that's becoming another factor is we still have to provide those services based on the funding we have. And with an increase in numbers, you have students with some higher needs, things like that. So we still have to make sure we provide those with those funds. So it does come out of that general fund first, um, which again, when we're increasing, you, over the last couple of years, we've increased 1%. So this year, from last year, we're already at 1% more than the year before. So we're already at 1,000 students this year. So um, that's huge when you're on a cap you still have to meet those needs. Um, and so where do you get that money? It comes from the general ed first. Um, and you don't get the reimbursement for all of it. And I know Scott has some more information on that too, but um, that's hard with some of the kids we're getting. And I know with COVID and things like that, 
we're seeing an influx in social emotional, you know, kids with more counseling, more needs that way. And so we're trying to make sure they get those needs met. What's hard is even with that, we have kids that need counseling, social work, and they moved where the counseling funding was before. So that's another hit to, I think, our general funds because that's moved into a different um, part of that the block, the funding, the general fund. So um, we're getting hit in a couple areas and the needs are just getting worse. So that kind of um, hurts a little bit too when it comes to funding, but we still have to make sure our students and staff are safe. So those are some big needs. Um, the other thing is with um, our students, we have to make sure we have that least restrictive environment. So we have some students that are in gen ed and they should be because they should be with their peers first, but we're seeing a growth. I mean, those kids are making growth and I know some people are you know you're getting the comments why are they in there can't you just pull them out well we can't do that either because they have every right to be with their general ed peers so we try to do inclusion as much as possible but we also have those kids that maybe need some extra pullout support so they go to the resource room but then they also have the gen ed for services um, so we have to make sure we provide that whole realm of services for needs um, we have some kids that are in programs, a little bit more severe, you know, maybe they can't be in resource, maybe they need a little bit more, they're pulled out. But then the biggest hit I think that we see is that we have students that we can't provide some of those services in the district. You know, we can't meet those needs. They need more intense needs. They may need some residential, they may need some other things that we as a district can't provide, some therapy pieces, um, some of that. But that's another hit that we see because, um, it's getting harder to make sure that we can meet their needs here, but there's not a lot of options either for placement. But we're seeing that our kids um, that we're getting, it's costing anywhere from over 5,000 to over 20,000 a month per student for some of those treatment facilities. And we can't deny that because those kids need that. So that's another piece that the IEP team determines that. Mm -hmm. We still have to do that. Yeah. I was going to say, so those would be like the out of district mm -hmm. placement mm -hmm. type things. Okay. Uh -huh. And you still have some, you know, some day schools, things like that, the residential. But for each kid, you're looking at possibly 200000 a year for one kid. And so that I know is a big hit too. That comes out of the general fund first. And then you can look at reimbursement the year after. And I know those are some big funding pieces that people look at. But under special ed, we have the legality piece too. We have to make sure we meet those needs here and make sure that we can service them with what their IEP teams decide. So I know those are some of those pieces that we're hearing questions on, you know, why are we placing them if it costs this? Where can we find some of that? Um, but I know that there was a question here too um, with that funding and I, um, Mr. Bajor, can we charge certain benefits and salaries of special education, compensatory education to federal title funds, to federal funds? Um, that's a great question. And you hear it a lot, you know, why can't we do that? But that's considered supplanting. <laughs> and so with that, if a state or your local agency cuts money, um, we still have to provide that. That does not give us the option to move them to that grant piece. You still have to use those state funds first before you can even look at the federal funds. So that really isn't an option, um, especially if it's already been in that general fund. You can't move it over because it was paid out of here. We can't move it to a different pocket for service for payment. So. Um, unfortunately, that's not an option with some of those services. Thank you, Casey. Mm -hmm. um, lots of um, questions on facilities. And I think that there's a great misunderstanding of, um, like, we awesome. have a brand new satellite high school being built, which we're getting ready to cut, so I, or not cut that, but we're looking at cutting a budget, and I can see the perception of that. So... I'm seeing a feed of um, the different questions on facilities. I, I would love to jump in right before Dan gets started because I, I've been with the district and not with the district. And anytime you're out there and we have a new school opening, the comments, and we are cutting money, the comment from the community is, why do you close schools? Why are you building new schools? And I really, I think with school funding, it's so complicated. So I think it's so important for us and for Dan especially because he really understands this to explain how how that works. I mean, that's a huge thing that you hear in the community all the time. Yeah, I was looking at these, and the first question, can we delay non-essential facility upgrades, repairs, and new construction? Uh, there's, there's a lot going on there. First of all, new construction, uh, 
looking at the satellite. That was funded two years ago under capital expenses with the state of Wyoming. It does not come out of the district's pocket. That money, uh, once we go there and show a need, and we do have a need because of the overcrowdedness at the high school, even today, um, they appropriated the correct amount of money or what they thought was the sufficient amount of money to build the school. And so two years ago, we were appropriated that money. It takes a while before we go through the process of selecting professional services, and then you go out to your, you know, for your, uh, your documents and then your bids. So that's why that project is going now, but it was actually funded two years ago. Um, on repairs, um, we prioritize our repairs. Obviously, if we had a compressor go down on a chiller this time of year versus a boiler, the chiller will wait until probably spring for numerous reasons. One, cost. Two, it just is more practical to do an HVAC repair on a compressor when the weather's warmer than it would be to do one now this time of year. And the boiler would be something that's coming into play immediately and will be with us for the next several months. So uh, there is a prioritization um, factor that we do. As far as uh, general repairs, uh, the general repairs that we do day to day are usually funded by the district and those are small repairs. Uh, anything over $1,000 I turn into the state of Wyoming uh, for major maintenance, it qualifies for major maintenance. Now on those repairs, a lot of the repairs that we do have already been designated by an outside entity by state statute uh, we have a slide up here that shows FCI scoring. FCI scoring uh, means facility condi condition index. By state law, every four years, the state hires a contracting company, professional service, and they go through all 48 districts. They score 24 components that make a building. You know, the, everything from the boilers, the foundation to the roof trusses and the roof coating, you know, coverings. And they score them. And as those scores... Um, increase, um, well, when you, they first put them in, they become a five. So five is like new. One is uh, immediate, re, you know, it has to be repaired immediately. So you have a score of one to five. We have in this district and have had for a long time uh, several tubes. They're mainly in the air handler systems and in the energy systems, uh, electrical systems that are outdated boiler systems um, that were, you know, haven't been changed out for a long time. Electrical systems as uh, lighting, not just the uh, uh, distribution, um, it, things like that, that since we're scored on, I have to, by state statute, every year develop a, a facility plan. That facility plan goes before our school board for its approval, and then it goes on to the state of Wyoming's school facilities department for their approval. I have to address all tubes. Ones, we only have one one in the district, and it's the greenhouse up at the high school because it leaks. Uh, we have, like I said, twos or windows. It, things that are just old with the building. Uh, the HVAC systems uh, um, are old. The control systems, we still have buildings with pneumatic controls. So we try to, up, we try to replace those as they fail because I'm required to. Now, the other and those come out of major maintenance money. The other question that we have here is facility updates. Unless I have no alternative, I only update unless I can work out some kind of an energy grant with, uh, we work closely with uh, Dominion and we work closely with Rocky Mountain Power. Uh, Rocky Mountain Power, I've had them come in numerous times over the last six years. They go through the buildings they show us where we can save energy. They present to us a plan for their reimbursements or rebates. And that's when we make our upgrades. On our schools, um, the state of Wyoming, Owen gives you X amount of dollars to build a school. There is no more. If it goes over, you're on your own. But what I try to do when we build a school is I include Dominion and I include Rocky Mountain Power. They go through those plans to see if there's any cost savings that we can generate through some kind of a grant program. For instance, if they had T5s, um, or yeah, T5s, T5HOs, and Rocky Mountain Power determined that LED lighting would be more effective and we would get a rebate for those. That's what they give us. And that's what we go for. And then we can take that money and put it towards that building. And it works the same way with our everyday lighting systems. 
a lot of times we go into schools and the uh, building administrator will wonder, why didn't you do every single class? Just the way they work their grants, they come in, they'll do a portion of the school, and then the following year they'll do more of the school, and they just kind of drag it out. That's just the way they do it. But that's when we do our updates. So there's another funding source. So we have district funding source, we have major maintenance funding source, we have grants. And then and one of the other questions here was uh, sponsorships for, for the billboard, and the example was the high school. We do reach out. This time, you know, economic times were not that well, you know, not that good. Um, but we also have another funding stream, and that is our, our uh, rec board money, our rec mill. The rec mill, they have actually, the rec board has been budgeting for replacement football fields, scoreboards, things like that for over 10 years. So that money has already been appropriated. We also have money set aside for the junior high track and field. And when they originally bought, you know, built that track and field, the state of Wyoming did not pay for a, uh, a turf field. So what they do is they give whatever they would give you for sod, you get credited at that, and then you have to put up the rest of the money. At that time, it was considered an enhancement, still is, and so the rec board put the money aside, or they came up with the money to pay for the field and track with all of, any of the bells and whistles that they wanted at that time. So this time when we replaced it, including the scoreboard, it was the rec board, the rec mill dollars that paid for that. So there was another funding stream. So uh, do we do these things? Yeah, but I do not put off repairs that are essential. You know, if I have a boiler and I have a pump or whatever goes bad in a classroom, it gets taken care of. The only time we, we don't do something like that and we prioritize is if, if for some reason, I can put it off a couple months because of weather. Obviously, if I had a, a roof that was leaking and I can put it off until after the winter, and a lot of times we have to because of the winter, then that's what we do. But for the most part, we try to take care of the things that are, have been put in on our facility plan. Even though the state asks for a two-year plan, I usually give them a five-year plan because it helps us, helps me anyway, locally, budget out. So then when folks say, well, when are we gonna get this replaced? Sometimes I'll do things in phases. The high school actually has five different sections of roofing on there, so I'm not gonna give a two-year plan when I can show when potentially we will re-roof the entire school is gonna be five years. And it, it just makes for a better plan, it's easier for me to manage, and then I can actually schedule some of the repairs and put some of them off if I have to. In fact, <clears throat> it was about a year ago. Our district was cited as one of the districts that didn't use all of their major maintenance money. Uh, the state was at a point where they were saying that if you don't use all your money, we're just going to take or not fund you the following year until your money is down to what we think is a reasonable level. The way the state statute reads is you can save 10% of your money, but your 10% money, first of all, you have to address all your, your uh, uh, FCI scores and all your components in those FCI scores. Then you can save 10% money. If everything has been addressed, 10% money goes towards enhancements, which are, would be anything that the state did not pay for in during construction, but you wanted to have, and so you built out of your own pocket. So with that 10%, for years, every district, and I've been with two districts, but every district has accumulated that money to, in some cases, millions of dollars. Um, the state statute reads, and they are enforcing the state statute as of this year because of the economic you know, downturn. You can only have 10%, and it can only equal the 10% of the, the dollar amount that you receive on an annual basis. So if you're up in Casper and you get $8 million, you can only save $800,000 can be in your 10% account. And that 10% account you can use for enhancements only if you address everything else. So going back to you know, the idea of prioritizing and putting things off, we, in a sense, do that. Um, and, it, and we do it effectively. There were districts that used up all of their money. And then come the uh, late sp or early spring, they had boilers go out. They got money back from the state to replace their boilers but it was deducted from their incoming payment in July. So our district does a pretty good job of monitoring our money and watching how we ration it out. 
we don't really go great guns and we don't do a whole lot of upgrades because I have been saying for years that I knew that this was coming. I go to every meeting. Superintendent has, you know, she wants me to go to these meetings. I go to select committee meetings. We're pretty in tune as to how things are going to go down the road. And so uh, from a facility standpoint, we still have to be cautious. But we kind of already do some of these things that have been suggested as far as in the facility side. Thank you, Dan. Um, we've got some questions and some comments over in the side. Um, I want to make sure that we acknowledge those and um, get to those responses. Um, Leslie, you had a, a comment about valuing our schools and, and keeping those open. Um, thank you for your comment. We, uh, we feel the same. Uh, we know a lot of our community values um, an education for our kids, and that's why you're here. So thank you for that. Um, you made a comment about keeping them open, and uh, that really is a, a tough thing uh, to do. There's a lot going on in our community at this time, and um, I want to make sure that I acknowledge, um, Darcy, you had mentioned um, about what those struggles are, and with those passing days and the... Um, the rise in confirmed cases in the in the community it does make it very very difficult for us and what our administrators are doing to help cover those classrooms and keep those doors open um, as much as we can we are in tier one for in-person learning and um, but I I think that struggle and what that really involves to keep things going is is very true and so Thank you, Darcy, for acknowledging that and for listening for that and putting that down. Um, and also, Leslie, for your comment. Uh, working through a, a couple of other things, um, the honest mom comment, um, the five-day school week, the full curriculum, reading, writing, math, STEM, specials, art, music, PE, health and library, um, so that quality education, thank you for that one. Um, we know that there was some clarification about the four-day week listed on the side. So thank you for that. That is uh, accurate information on there. Um, Scott, Harold had a question. I know Casey answered that about the certain benefits and salaries about special ed. Um, just anything to make sure that we have you know, adding on to what Casey had mentioned there before we move that forward? No, I think as Casey mentioned, the biggest takeaway is the supplanting issue because if it's paid for from the general fund already, you can't move it into the federal fund, you know, any federal fund. Um, otherwise, it would be an allowable cost and then they make you pay that money back. So I, I've always struggled with the supplanting. I really have. And I think that where it clicked in for me was we had a grant at one point that we purchased Apple TVs with. So we had to be very careful not to, we worked through the grant process and through the teacher application process for Apple TVs. But the, when the district starts paying for those out of the general fund, then that's something that we can't go back towards the grant. Would I, am I understanding that correctly? Or um, I, it, it's really been tough for me. So and I know I'm not the brightest one, but if it's tough for me, maybe there's other people in the community who really struggle to understand what the supplanting piece means. Is yeah. that kind of accurate a little bit? Yeah, that's the gist of it. And okay. those, those rules are actually pretty complicated and they're even more complicated at the state level because there are different interpretations now as to what is considered supplanting compared to what the feds consider supplanting. And so they're working through those, um, through the special education a piece of the recalibration as as well but generally if you pay for it first from the general fund you can't shift those costs mm -hmm. over gotcha thank you scott for doing that um let's go to a couple questions um from nancy hers is about if certified positions are cut what areas would be in jeopardy first um nicole from human resources if you want to start there i'm happy to chime in too, but that's actually a very difficult question to um, answer at this point, just because it would depend our state in the, um, why can I not think of this session and recalibration? 
Oh, the recalibration model, right. Our funding model, they're looking at recalibrating it. Thank it's, been you, long, it's been a long day, Nicole. It really has. Um, we have what's called a basket of goods. And what that basket of goods is, those are the things that we are required to provide to our students. And so if they alter the basket of goods, then that would force us to look at specific areas. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, our reduction in force policy, if we had to go that route, does dictate that we start with experience. Um, but from there, it would be as positions open through attrition, trying to close those positions, and that would be in various areas. The other reason this question is really difficult to answer is because right now the PTSB, our Professional Teaching Standards Board, Wyoming has always been extremely um, strict on our teachers being highly qualified and certified. But with positions around Wyoming being more difficult to fill, they have given us um, options with exception authorization. So someone that has a, well, I did it when I very first started teaching. So I have an elementary degree and I taught in special education and did my master's program. And so I, they allowed me three years to work in that area under an exception. And then they've got some new COVID exceptions. So it's actually giving us a little more leeway so that if teachers are specifically only certified in math, say, that we could have some options if there was a science um, openings instead of um, having to let that teacher go, putting them in the open science position. So I don't know that there's a targeted area that we start with. It all depends on what comes down from the legislature, what happens with our recalibration, and then what happens with enrollment, where there's openings, and um, yeah. I don't know how else to answer that. I, I apologize. I'm trying the best I can, but that's a really difficult one to answer. I really can't give a straight answer on that. There's a lot of components that go into the certification and the personnel side. So my, my hopeful answer is that we don't have to <laughs> do that. But No, Nicole, I think that was a, a great answer. That was um, the best that we can do it at this point. We, we want to take care of... Um, you know, people are the greatest asset that you have in the organization, and that's our staff and our students and our, our families. So can I answer one more that just came through? Sure. See, these are the ones that are stabbing at my heart that I just... Um, William asked, should first-year teachers, new hires, start planning on finding new jobs for the school year for 21-22? I, I no. want to say no. Um, we want to retain... Our young teachers, our highly qualified teachers, our experienced teachers, we want to retain you for the district. We want to keep you. The unfortunate thing is right now, I, we just don't know where things are going. And like I said, we're planning for the worst. Oops, but we're, sorry, Zach, but we're hoping for the best. I'll put it down. We're hoping for the best. Um, and the last time we went through this, we did not have to do a reduction in force and we were able to place teachers where they need to be. But I'm gonna tell you from the human resource side, that is my biggest fear. I don't want a mass exit because people are, but people have to think for themselves and plan ahead. And I wish I could give you any kind of information as we get it. I will give it to you guys, but I don't want you guys to. I, th I think it's important to talk about the last time we did the cost savings task force in the 16, 17 school year. Is that right? Okay, mm -hmm. so if you go to our website, there is actually all of the documentation and the information from the last time. It's under the superintendent link at the top and the 1617 cost savings task force. I was still fairly green in the role of the AA director. So it was a big learning experience for me, but I will say that the district did everything in their power to make sure that we didn't hurt staff. They, I, I'm privileged to work for a district that actually looks ahead and plans for everything and no matter what comes out of a legislative session they there's a plan in place for us to be able to move forward and get through it with the least amount of of damage we really want to make sure we keep our kids first and foremost and we know the best thing for our kids is the qualified staff in the classroom with them so when everybody's asking for the timeline that if i remember correctly is kind of how that played out last time the big the big thing was, when are we going to know? Well, as soon as the legislative session closed and we knew what the cuts were going to look like, then we had 
you know, plan A, plan B, plan C that the board had voted on that we were able to move forward. So thank you, Steph. I appreciate that. Um, working through some of the other comments um, and suggestions there. Um, I know Harold, you had some questions about the facilities and I know Dan's um, answered that one for you. Um, Scott, there was a question on here from Harold about business sponsors and electronic billboard, those kind of things. How about that one? Sure, yes. The short answer to that is yes with restrictions. Although as Dan mentioned that the scoreboard was funded from the recreation mills. And so, um, you know, and we also have ongoing agreements with businesses already, for example, the old scoreboard and um, some of the goods that can be sold in the high school are under uh, that type of agreement. But I think it's important to note that, you know, that mountain, that deficit is so large, it's going to, it would take something of a huge nature of that to kind of get the dollars to work. There's some other avenues as well. Um, for example, the foundation has a mechanism where you can, you know, pay to put your name on a building or other things like that. That hasn't really been used too much, but that would be another um, avenue for funding is through the foundation in that respect. And most every school also has their own fundraisers that they do to um, raise funds for their students and their student activity funds. The biggest ones, of course, are the, the high schools. But as far as, um, you know, those businesses, then, you know, that you, you can do it. There are restrictions around it um, to follow our policies, but yes, that you can. Thank you, Scott. Um, one thing that you had mentioned, Scott, was about the Sweetwater Number 1 School District Foundation. And, um, you know, I've, I've got to give some credit for our foundation because so many times they get requests to help out a student in need or a family um, or a staff member. And um, I can truly say I've never seen a time where they have um, turned down helping a student when they can. And so a, a huge kudo for our foundation. We're, we're lucky to have that entity to help us out. Um, some more ideas going through. Um, Darcy, you have this suggestion about the quarter day leave for teachers uh, for substitutes. Uh, we appreciate that suggestion um, going through there. Um, thank you for that. We are looking at different avenues for um, utilizing our subs. I think it's important to say to, I mean, we've had a lot of people join in since we started all of the comments that we're receiving, we are keeping, and we're going to bring those to the cost savings task force um, on Thursday, right? Yep. We're going to bring all those. And then uh, from the communications email address, and then the task force will have some ideas too. So hopefully with all those avenues, we, we have a, a good bank of things to build from if we need to. Okay, um, moving forward. Um, thank you, Michelle, for your comment. We appreciate that. We know everybody's working hard in this time, so we appreciate it. Um, Harold's got a question about, can we reduce the number of consultants used by the district? Um, I'm going to speak on a big picture um, as far as consultants by the district, and then Jody, if there's anything you want to add from a curriculum standpoint, and then Casey, if you want to add from a special ed, um, that would be great. But um, overall, as a district, we don't have many consultants that come in um, into Sweetwater, number one. I can say travel uh, for our staff is pretty much non-existent. Uh, for this year, there's just too many safety concerns and keeping our staff as safe as we, as we can. Um, and with the fiscal, you know, travel is, is just not a, it's not a good time for those kind of things. And plus, we want to keep our staff in the classroom um, so they can be with kids. We know that what happened last March has definitely been a long haul, but uh, we really don't have many consultants that come in. I know, um, Jody, I'll start us off. We have one that comes in uh, from curriculum with the curriculum and assessment and alignment. Um, and they work with us. That's important for our accreditation pieces for that. Um, I know we have that. 
Uh, we have the statewide system of supports, but a lot of that is funded through the Wyoming Department of Education. And then also the other funding for that comes through the Title I grant uh, for it. So there's not a lot of general fund that's coming out of that. Um, and general fund is uh, where we've got to be really careful because to be responsible, you want to use your grants as much as you can. And then um, that to make sure that we comply, uh, Scott had talked about the supplanting issue, but you really want to strategically use your grants first whenever you can. And then, of course, that general fund would come after. But um, I know from the curriculum, you know, we have, uh, like I mentioned, through WDE and Title I grants. Um, and Jody, is there anything else that you want to mention? We don't, we don't have a lot going on. We really don't. Um, thank you for the great question. We, as the new chief academic officer coming in uh, during a difficult time with COVID and then these potential cutbacks, it's made it easy for me to look at everything with a different lens. And so we really have tried to cut back all of any consultant that we've used in the past and instead uh, we're providing a lot of internal training from our own district experts. Um, our, our technology rock stars are our teachers who have stepped up and said that they would teach their colleagues on the virtual training pieces that we really needed to have this year. And other than that, we've really tried to not involve other consultants other than our own people. I do have to say that if there is, um, we do have uh, CLI, our, our partnership with uh, the curriculum piece, but we do also have maintenance of effort. And so we have to spend a certain amount of our money in order to be in compliance with our federal funding. And so we do have to spend a little bit of money on our, on extras like that. but. We are definitely looking at every piece very clearly and making sure that it's only a priority. Can someone touch really quick on the CLI? So the consultant that comes in, like what does that do for our teachers or how does that help the district? Like that partnership. So um, I'm new to the process and I'm new to the um, district, but I can tell you that over the last seven years, the district has been in partnership with the organization and they have helped really organize the curriculum and common assessment thread for student achievement in this district. And so they've really, the partnership today, uh, the CCC met with the consultant from CLI and um, just hearing of, of the success that they've had over the last seven years in organizing all of the important curricular pieces for Sweetwater to be successful, it's, it's really great work. And so we're lucky to be a part of that. So Stephanie, um, just to add on what Jody was saying, it's really um, what it is our students need to know so um, whether it's a content area class or a grade level, uh, making sure that everyone is on the same page about what our kids need to know and be able to do. And then the assessment piece is how do we measure that? So how are our students performing? How do they compare to their peers? And then what do we do when they need some interventions or maybe some enrichments um, for those that need it? So it's really the alignment of those two. It's very important that we have those. It's part of the accreditation process and also part of the work that we do within the district. Once you have that, then you align resources to it. And, um, and that's what gets into the classroom for our teachers. So really, I think the way that I can kind of relate that process or that I, the way that I have since I've, I've been here um, I see what we've done with school safety, how in every building when I first came back, it was a different process for different situations. So we aligned our school safety efforts. So really a student who moves from fourth grade at Sage to fourth grade at Stagecoach, really they should be right around the same area because of these processes. Is that, is that kind of, is that exactly. an accurate way to put it? Okay. Yes, exactly. Uh, the one other consultant that we are using this year is Solution Tree, and that is to improve the RTI process, and that is actually funded through a grant. 
from Casey. So if you want to touch upon that. Yeah, I was just going to piggyback off that. Mm -hmm. um, we do use Solution Tree. That's a partnership, too, with WDE as well. Um, we have noted, um, you know, in special education, we get a yearly report card. And so sometimes those report cards help determine some of those training pieces. Um, one was, and I know that has been a concern, so that actually addresses another special ed concern. So um, one is the over-identification of SPED. And so one of the processes that we're kind of lacking um, that we're trying to overcome is um, an MTSS RTI model within the district for interventions for some of our students. So that was one of the areas noted um, through our report card, through you know data um, that we're trying to support with our staff in our district right now is that um, RTI through Solution Tree. So we are doing that. Um, the other partnerships we have is we are working with Black Hill State Co-op, um, another one with our WD report card. They're coming in and they're actually doing more of a facilitation with our staff, kind of looking at how they could support us with training with the district to kind of overcome some of those issues with our report card. So we do have that contract. Um, and we're like, um, like Jody was talking, we're trying to build capacity within the district. I think one of the things we saw with COVID is um, the training pieces we had in place for some of that building capacity kind of went on the wayside because we weren't able to do some of that in-house training for staff. Um, so that's something we're working through, we need to get through. So I think that once we can get some of those trainings in place, we'll be able to build our own staff into that, those roles for trainings. Thank you, Casey. Mm -hmm. uh, working through over here on the right, um, can we seek additional funding through federal grants? The United States Department of Education has many grant programs that we could look at if we are not fully participating in them. Um, I know we talked about grants just a little bit. Um, I think that's an excellent idea if there's um, grant opportunities that we need to tap into. We talked a little bit strategically about, you know, how you want to use those in your fiscal plan, um, but I think that's a great idea also to put out on, on the table for that. So thank you. Um, uh, Question um, from Nancy. I just lost my place. She had a question about the timeline and um, when does all that stuff have to get put into place? Scott, from a fiscal end, do you want to um, mention that one? Sure. It's really going to start with the legislature and they start um, the middle of January and run till the first part of March. And so then depending on what happens during recalibration and what falls in the basket of goods and how those um, that basket of goods is funded, that's really going to drive what we do. Um, it does put us into a time crunch being that they'll be done in, in March unless they move it back. There's been some talk about that as well. But it takes the WDE a little bit of time to implement the block grant. So we won't know what our funding is even after the legislature is done, but that does put us into a bind in recruiting because um, you know, we don't know if we're gonna have the money to fill all of the, of the positions and that's prime recruiting time for us as well. So the longer that process drags out, the, the more we're kind of backed into a corner time-wise. Thank you, Scott. Um, going through uh, some of the other comments, um, we have one from Ms. Simpson. Um, elementary kiddos that are talking about the elections and the candidates because um, they can hear staff members talking about that in, in school. Um, not acceptable, not neutral teaching um, on there. Um, I think on that one, just a little bit of feedback on there is um, it may be a good idea on that one to uh, visit with the classroom teacher and honestly get the context of that whole situation uh, to make sure that we have, um, is there a discussion going on? Um, it's not about one side or the other. Um, I think in one of our earlier sessions today, that conversation came up. Um, it's not about... Um, putting the point of view from a, a staff member on students, but 
It's about um, putting facts out and then having the students be able to come up with their own point of view and teaching kids to think in all areas and how do they make a valid argument using facts and um, persuasion if, if that's what that context is going to be. Um, but again, um, on that one, if there's something going on there, I would truly encourage um, some open communication, um, beginning with our classroom teachers, uh, to see how uh, what's really going on in that classroom. A lot of times, uh, it's just a communication um, issue is we want to support the students uh, very much and support our families as well. So um, there's a question on there about do we have any facilities that we can um, rent out? On that one, um, Dan, if you want to take, take that, I, I know our answer is no on that. Um, yeah. But if you wanted to add anything to it, please do so. Uh, well, the, you know, the one building uh, that we said no to was Lincoln because <clears throat> Lincoln itself was in such disrepair that it, it, it just not a good building space. Uh, the other issue is uh, rent out a building that the district has. Uh, there's all kinds of complications. One of the major things is whoever rents it has to be responsible for the upkeep of the building. That is one of the, you know, one of the big uh, things that they have actually highlighted and, and, and it's bolded. Um, and generally speaking, um, if somebody takes over a building and they were fortunate enough to rent from a school district, the maintenance cost on most of those buildings is pretty high. And so at that point, um, they would have to meet the FCI scores just like the district does. The district is responsible, but the tenant of the building would have to be responsible for meeting all of these same criteria that the School Facilities Commission lays down for schools. So it just becomes a matter of, um, it, it's not economically feasible for, for us to do it. And plus, there's, there's just all kinds of other legal issues. So generally speaking, no. It's very difficult to rent an old school building to someone. Thank you, Dan, for adding on to that and providing some further explanation for it. Um, working through then, um, there's a question um, about outsourcing. Um, some of the areas like IT or the help desk. Um, Steph, I'm going to let you speak to that. I, I know that's come up before about um, outsourcing, not for IT, but outsourcing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to you so you can add a little bit of detail on that one and perhaps maybe talk about the volume yeah. um, of yeah. things that are coming through. I know that you do a just an audit in the department about how things are going and what does that really look like uh, with the staffing that you have. So I think that would be good information too. So as of right now, I am budgeted for 18 people in my department. We lease, recently lost one to a retirement. Congratulations to Pat. So we are down to 17 and we haven't filled that position at this time. Um, I think it's important to say that of those 18 people, 10 of them are our building support folks. And we have approximately 11,000 devices, iPads, laptops, and computers across the district. So when you stop and think about that, my staff is supporting on average about actually a little over 1,000 devices for each one of those building techs. I will say that I'm, um, I've heard positive and very great things about how prepared we were to be able to move online last year in March. And I think that my staff is very efficient as far as maintaining the machines, maintaining the devices, making sure our kids have what they need. Um, I know that we've had some issues with our content filter. We're definitely working through those. But when you look at outsourcing some of those resources, we utilize all of the, the pieces that we can. So Canvas support, we use their support. We encourage our teachers to open tickets. With Swivel, we're considered a, I believe, a gold star district. So if our teachers reach out, we get escalated to the highest level of support so that they know how to help us right away. So for those types of pieces, we definitely use um, the experts in that area. I think it's similar to how we build capacity within with the teachers, the rock star teachers who have worked so very hard this year to make sure that all of our teachers have the um, access to resources and videos. There's an amazing page on our website where if you're 
just looking for something to do someday, you can actually go see all of the videos and all of the resources that have been put together by the Rockstar teachers. So I kind of think of, you know, the outsourcing. Really, we have built capacity with our staff within the district, and I think we're working very hard to do that. And I think that we do the same with the IT department so that we can you know, be that first line of contact to make sure our students and our staff have everything they need, no matter which tier of, of learning that we're in. At the volume of, I'm sure COVID's been, been fun for IT departments across the country. So uh, the volume of help desk tickets that we have, we have a student help desk we implemented last year. So we have kids opening tickets and, and my staff is just doing a phenomenal job. I think we're over a thousand tickets higher this year at this point than we were last year at the same time for the number of, of support cases that we're helping our, our students and staff with. So everything that we can utilize outside resources we do. Um, one other thing that did come up this morning in the first session was software. I will say that when I first came in, we really, and when we were looking at those 16, 17 cuts, we really evaluated all of the programs in the district. And we've worked very closely with the curriculum department to identify usage, what benefits our students, what benefits our staff. And we cut, I want to say, between $150,000 and $200,000 out of our software budget and really just focused in on what we were getting the biggest bang for our buck for for our devices, we do that purchasing out of capital projects, so that actually doesn't have an impact on the general fund. Um, we use those as long as possible, even when we pull them out after six or seven years, we repurpose them for submachines or kiosk machines. Um, we, we really stretch everything as long as we can, and I think that when people mention Apple, I will say that I, we can keep a, a Macintosh computer running far longer, I think, in some cases than you can see with some of the PCs and our I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful that our board prioritized technology. I'm thankful that we were ready. And I, I want everyone to know that we look at our budget each year very responsibly to make sure that we are using what we pay for and we're getting what we expect out of what we pay for. Thank you, Steph. Um, I uh, was notified there was um, an idea and I didn't mean to go over it. So I'm going to go back to it. I want to make sure that I acknowledge something. So if I don't, I, I sure don't mean to do that, so I apologize. Um, there was an idea about eliminating special audits or efficiency audits as um, a cost-saving idea, so thank you for that. Okay. Um, working through, um, thank you for the feedback, um, trying to keep us at Tier 1 and um, from Harold and Darcy supporting people. Um, doing what we can do. We're sure we're sure working hard together. Um, Sarah, thank you for the feedback on that. Um, it, it's a really tough thing to even talk about these kind of things and put it out there for our whole community. And so um, I know what that's like to hear those things and it's just as difficult for us to talk about them. So can I add to that? Um, please, Nicole just because there was some other comments in here too. If there's one thing I can say to our new teachers or new staff to our district, even within the last couple of years, this is easier said than done, I understand that, but we're in the middle of November. I would say don't panic and start looking just yet. I mean, we don't know where this is gonna go and this district has been very proactive in trying to do whatever it takes to take care of their staff and save jobs. Now with that, obviously there's no guarantee, um, but this was one of my worst fears. I mean, we wanna be upfront, we wanna communicate and we wanna make sure you guys have all the information that we have and the concerns that we have. Um, but the fear with that is always causing panic. And I don't want to cause panic, but we do have to be upfront and honest with where we're at and what we're looking at. But I would, I would say don't jump to looking at jobs just yet. Um, we will keep you informed. Thank you, Nicole. Um, some other ideas. Um, an idea to rent out athletic equipment or have a cleaning fee. Uh, another one about the timeline. Um, I think we've talked about that one. Uh, another cost-saving idea. Um, is there anything we can do about bus routes and consolidating those? Um, Dan, any comment um, 
there's an idea about less energy and utilities. Any anything on that one? We actually do a really good job. Um, since I've been here, every year we've improved. Uh, we've gone from pneumatics to DDC controls, which that in itself uh, helps out with energy. We've gone from, um, we've changed over from just direct drive motors to uh, variable frequency drive motors. We still have a couple schools that, um, just because of the size of the project, they're in our five-year plan, but we haven't gotten around to it yet. Uh, one of the things, too, is with COVID hitting us, we have to bring in 100% outside air until our systems can no longer take it or we do something with our systems. We have, uh, we're going around installing uh, new filter systems. Uh, along with the filter systems, we'll be install installing the UV lights. UV lights, like everybody else, they're manufactured in New Jersey and in Indiana, and they are hit with COVID just like everyone else is, but they should be here the end of this month, beginning of next month. So we're starting to mobilize and you know put the power systems in there, 115 volt systems. Once those get in, um, then we'll switch to recirculating the air instead of using outside air. Currently, we run outside air, and ASHRAE's uh, newest standard, along with CDC, is they're allowing us to do what they call flush the buildings. So all summer for the last nine months, we were running 100% outside air in, 100% outside air out. Now what we do is we come in, we flush the buildings for two hours, and then shut, shut the, uh, the outside air dampers down to 80%. So it's not 100%, but it's close. With the new filters that we're putting in, uh, these are, again, recommended by the ASHRAE and CDC standards to be the minimum filtration system that you can use without stressing out your air handler systems and taking care of the, you know, trapping the virus. So, yeah, we, we, we are very proactive. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we get with Rocky Mountain Power. We get with Dominion. In fact, I have a note on my desk out there today after our last lunch, um, you know, YouTube uh, virtual meeting. And there was a, a paper there to contact one of the guys from Dominion because our, we had replaced some boilers, and those boilers qualify for rebates. They come in. They do all the adjustments. So, yeah, we, we're very energy conscious. Unfortunately, this year with COVID, it's kind of forced everyone to be non-energy conscious, even though I, you cringe, but we're, we'll get back on track here in the next couple of weeks. So. Thank you, Dan. Um, Scott, there's a, um, a comment on this one about um, the one cent local sales tax to help out schools at this time. Uh, we're hearing about that a, a little bit. I don't know if you have any comments on that one. I know there's not a whole lot of specifics or anything like, like that, but is there anything on that that you want to maybe add? I want to make sure we acknowledge that. Sure. There is some support out there for a one cent sales tax specifically dedicated to education. You know, we don't really know where that goes. That would have to go to the legislature and through the legislature to take that into effect but there is some support out there and that would be enough to bridge the budget gap for the biennium at the state level and if i might jump down to one there's a question on the basket of goods mm -hmm. as well and basically the basket of goods is what it takes to provide an adequate education for a wyoming student whether they live in rock springs or green river or matitsi saratoga anywhere in the state um, and so the way the funding mechanism works is the money from the state comes in the form of a block grant. So it's not specifically identified on what to spend your money on, but it's um, an amount in total that the local districts decide how that is spent. And so um, in part, the legislature does decide some programs and some classes and um, you know, the district can go over and above that. For example, there are certain, you know, requirements that you have to have for graduation and whatnot. And so, you know, you have to provide those, but there may be other programs mm -hmm. over and above that that the district decides to do. Um, and the final question was, will they, being the legislature, um, tell the district what programs to cut? Largely, they control the purse strings. So they would just say, well, we're not going to fund this piece anymore or we're going to provide funding for this piece but then again it's up to the local districts to decide how that um, 
pot of money is spent. Thank you, Scott. A um, couple other uh, working our way through. I, I want to mention, too, um, our forum for tonight, we were scheduled to go from 5.30 until 7. And I just want everyone to know that we will stay. We'll work through any of these questions or ideas. So um, I know we're hitting that 7 o'clock, but these ideas and suggestions are exactly um, what we're interested in having. And so we appreciate your time and we'll stay and we'll make sure that we um, address those and acknowledge those ideas that you've got. Uh, there was one about what other grants can we go after? We actually have a director of grants and federal programs um, that keeps an eye on all of those um, and other opportunities. And so we're always on the lookout for them that are doable for Sweetwater One and that we can also sustain. Uh, we know that grants sometimes come with a lot of compliance pieces. And so we want to make sure that it's manageable that will also meet the strategic plan for the district. So appreciate that. Um, I just want to make a comment. It's, it's great to see the positive, respectful dialogue that's going on in, in the chat. We know we've got a lot of people that are answering questions um, to one another and providing ideas. And so we just want to say thank you for it. Um, Clint, we know that um, you're replying about um, some ideas that you've got about helping with some things. Um, you're talking about a, a booster club, so thank you for joining in. Um, Miss Simpson, um, you're talking about a school on a different situation. Um, thank you for that information. Uh, the district doesn't have uh, any problem uh, addressing um, anything. Again, I would encourage um, that open communication directly with the school on there, and we can follow up with that as, as well. So thank you. Another idea that's coming through is uh, money donations. I know Scott had talked about that a little bit. Um, this one's got about tiered donors. We actually have a policy about that, um, and I believe that's what uh, you may have been referring to before, but thank you for that idea. That's a great idea. Um, Annette, going through, um, thank you for your feedback on that. We're going to try to do everything that we can to work together and, and do what's right on there. Um, another idea coming forward about um, consulting fees, pushing those back um, on the state uh, <laughs> level there. Got a little chuckle in the room. <laughs> um, but thank you for that um, idea for us. Um, going through, uh, we've got a concern coming through about concern for um, a subgroup of our kids for our English language students and making sure that they still receive that report or that support, excuse me. Um, that is important that we do um, support for all kids. So. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for responding to that. Um, I believe those are required services. Yes. So they, they that's are. not, I mean, um, just like special education, there's required um, services and there's laws that dictate and guide our English language learner support. So those won't go away. We'll just have to figure out a way to offer all of the stuff we're supposed to offer with the funding cuts, that becomes the interesting part. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, working through, I know Scott talked about basket of goods, uh, the importance of communicating. Uh, Stephanie, thank you for clarifying on there. Um, Sarah, about supporting our parents with some videos on there for um, making sure our parents can help our our students um, at home. I'm going to touch on that again really quick because I know exactly okay. what Sarah's saying. So when I talked about the Rockstar Teachers and that website, um, Zach, do you mind bringing up the website super fast? I'm sorry. I know everybody's probably tired of us. Um, and we want to go to the staff training and profession. It's right on the left down in the news section to the left of the slideshow. So staff training and professional development. 
So if you scroll down through here, this is the work that we were talking about that our staff has been doing to provide uh, videos and information. And there's parent videos to assist parents at home. I think that the might not be the right are, one. The parent videos are on the uh, parent link. Oh, gotcha. It's on the home page. Thank you, Jody. Mm -hmm. You can go to the home page and then over on the bottom right, Zach, by the staff links. There's a parent links. Oh, right there, the green one. Yep. And so if you click there. Awesome. And so those are yeah. cool. where we have the parent videos. So tons, tons of information to support our parents out there and our staff. Mm -hmm. We don't have to watch the YouTube, Zach. We're on the YouTubes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for pointing that out. I think that's great information to support our parents. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, another idea, um, is there any reductions in our costs about bidding and purchasing? Um, so an, an idea to consider advertising on our buses. Um, another idea, so we're keep adding those um, to our list. Um, Harold's got an idea about creating a, an electric purchasing pool with private businesses. So another cost savings idea. Um, is there a way to get utilities to offer discount or reduction in fees to the district? Um, that's a question on there. I think that one might be good to answer, Dan, if, if you want to go ahead and take that one real quick. I know our time's gone, but that's sure. a good question. The only discount that is available to us is um, when you put it, when you build a build, when you put up a building, you have a, a, a load meter and that's why we put VFDs on because the way it used to be was at certain times of the day when all of the equipment come on, it would spike your meter and your rates were based on that spike. But by putting in VFDs and have what they call soft, soft starts, it keeps our costs down. But as far as getting any kind of a, a discount because we're a district, Scott, I don't believe that that's ever been a case. Um, I know when we go and put in a new school, they charge us what uh, Chevron or Exxon would be for power, you know, to the building. There is no differentiating, you know, differentiation of a uh, school district versus a business. So to, to my knowledge, no, but I would be more than happy to look into it. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. We appreciate that. Um, just a couple other feedback things. Um, a sincere thank you for everybody for joining us and providing your ideas. Uh, we need that input. Uh, Nancy, thank you on there uh, for your comments about not trying to hurt our staff and our students. That, that's definitely the, the case. Um, another idea, solar panels on our buildings. Um, we appreciate that feedback on that one too um, and I think I'm near the I think we're hit the them end all. of it um, any final thoughts on those of us here that we need to share back out with our community? I just I just want to do one quick final plug on the communications email I put it in the comments on the the, the chat but please it once we end this if you still have information you want to share ideas you want to share just email at communication or communications at sw1.k12.wi.us it's on the screen there it's also available on our cost savings task force page on the website we will accept um, comments that we'll bring to the task force on thursday through 4 p.m tomorrow so please make sure you get that information to us by 4 p.m tomorrow thank you steph um, anyone else in here? We had one final comment on there. Um, just some feedback from Natalie. Uh, we appreciate that, Natalie. Thank you. We're trying to get information out and being as open as we can to people, so we appreciate it. Anything, any final thoughts? Um, otherwise, thank you, everybody. Stay safe and have a good evening. Shout out to my grandkids if they hung in this long.